Hello, everybody. Uh, Is this on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's only for the video. Ah, I see. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out on this uh, beautiful, sunny, warm Tel Aviv day. Uh, we're talking today about identity, uh, which sits at the very core of the human experience. Um, and especially on our digital lives, the question of identity becomes uh, ever more uh, important and critical to make the right decisions uh, now as we're building out this new infrastructure. So I'm, I'm really uh, honored to get to chat with uh, uh, these four panelists here um, who are all at the front line, builders building and making these decisions about uh, uh, decentralized identity. So uh, we have uh, next to me Makoto, who is one of the core developers at uh, ENS um, and has been working on their uh, L2 uh, uh, solutions as well. Uh, we have Dave uh, Montali, uh, who's a blockchain entrepreneur, uh, machine learning researcher, uh, and is now working on a project called Nimi, which is a, uh, a new social uh, uh, web page experience on top of ENS. Uh, Itai Turbin is the CEO of uh, Dynamic, which is a, uh, a new and really exciting uh, authentication uh, tooling service uh, for Web3. Uh, and finally, Al Rohn. Uh, is a uh, PhD in mathematics, has done a lot of very interesting projects in the space, and is now working on Woolball, which is a new uh, uh, ID system that uses links. Um, so, welcome. Uh, maybe before we jump into identity, uh, you know, you, got, you guys are all builders, so I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, what made you first start building uh, in, in Web3, and, and what was your aha moment? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, I got into Ethereum back in 2016, and the first thing I built was, uh, like when I got into the Web3, everything I didn't make sense, so I started going to lots of events, and many events had a uh, kind of no-show issues. So I created a thing called uh, Block Party, rebranded as a kickback, where you basically stake East to attend the events. And if you don't come, we share with the uh, people who came. So once in 2017, I organized events, and the uh, people all bet one East. Half people didn't come, so I got like a half East. That was a good story. That was aha moment, actually. <laughs> um. <clears throat> My first crypto meetup was actually in New York, uh, Ethereum meetup in 2016 during the Shanghai attack. So that was like a very interesting way to get introduced to like the community. And since then just started contributing to like, just like bullish on like building an open infrastructure for future economy and just, yeah, generally bullish on that. Um, on my end, I, I, I guess I was obsessed with crypto since like 2012, 2013. But I really, my aha moment to your point, I think was really when you set up, I set up kind of a MetaMask wallet, I, which wasn't fun. But then I went to OpenSea and kind of bought a couple of things and then went to a second site and just connected and all my things showed up. Right? And then I went to a third site and connected and then all my things showed up again. And this was the kind of this magical feeling of, hey, you can carry your things with you through a thing that is both like a storage device and a payment device and a login device, which is pretty remarkable. And for me, I was like, okay, clearly this is the way uh, things should work and things will work uh, for, for folks. So that, that was for me the real aha moment. Okay, so I was in Bitcoin for a while, and I was actually anti-Ethereum, um, but I have, I, I admit, I was heavily online, not, not, not liking Ethereum, but I have a really good friend, uh, Paul Pierregood, he, he was a developer in Golem and almost ago, and whenever we were in some town together, we always met up for a few hours and did, we read crypto papers together, uh, did some research, programs and stuff, and then beginning 2019, uh, we were in a cafe, each doing his own thing, and suddenly he was like, huh, it's actually working. And I was like, what? And he went to the browser, uh, and he just typed, you know, his nickname, pepesha.eth, and it went to his website, like the IPFS website. And I was like, wow. Because at the time, I had a beef with Google. I tried to, <laughs> I tried to de-Google myself, uh, and I failed. Though I had a lot of free time, I really failed to not have Google involved in my life. 
and I started not to like this current web that we have. I thought that maybe I cannot be there without big tech. And uh, he showed me like a simple alternative with ENS and IPFS that worked. And I was like, let's do something with that. We started with a side project and uh, yeah, I mean, almost four years later, I'm dedicating my life to decentralized web uh, uh, alternative to the regular web. So this was my aha moment. Somebody showed me how it works. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll stop on you a second. Sure. Uh, what is identity, um, and, and what does that mean in, in the Web3 sense? Yeah, so uh, first to your point, identity in general is a pretty kind of uh, a gigantic concept. Uh, in Web3 specifically, or in, in the Web specifically, I think it's mostly about kind of the ability for someone to tell a, a thing or a website or an app they interact with who they are, what they care about, what information they're willing to share, uh, and kind of in, uh, kind of establish an interaction point um, with that website. Right? Identity in Web3 specifically is the ability to go way deeper into what you share with websites, how you control that information, and do it uh, ideally in a privacy-preserving manner that allows you to kind of share as much as humanly possible without actually giving up uh, almost anything. And so specifically Web3 identity is kind of the evolution of really how we can interact with websites uh, and, and kind of provide, gain more value while providing the, the minimal amount of information for the website to kind of, you know, um, generate a, a wonderful kind of experience for you. Right, so that that's a little bit about um, you know Web three identity identity in general. To your point, is really every it's more of a philosophical. Uh, we can spend a couple of hours talking about what identity is, but in the Web three context, that's that's really it. Um, so I'm I'm going to take this uh, uh, AL to you uh, in a second, but it seems like identity is one of these things that are uh, uh, so ingrained uh, into uh, into everything we do that we almost ignore it, um, and so. Uh, you know, we're lucky to have uh, tools in Web2 that make it really easy uh, to have an identity, to log on to websites, to have an email. Um, so, Al, what do you think it is that decentralized identity enables specifically that we can't get today uh, on Web2 alternatives? Sure, that's, that's a great question because I've been asked that a lot and, and it took me a while to get a good answer. Um, I'm going to speak from a very, very narrow point of view. Um, I mean, I, I'm in decentralized web, which is a niche of web free. Uh, there are peer to peer websites. And the simple answer there is just that the web two identity doesn't work there. <laughs> it, it, it needs to have a server, you know, uh, you don't have a server, it's not working. So it, it's it's in, in my setting, it's not the, the first question is if you can use web two um, identity and you can't. So for me, the question is some like, somehow like, why should you have a different kind of web? And once you answer this question is, you know, why, should, why do you need a web-free identity? And you know, this is for this web. Um, like our, or I mean, in this community that I, am, that I am, one of the things that we have a super far away science fiction vision um, is, is that to have a web which is alternative to the current one, but managed by a DAO. So, you know, uh, uh, but in a democratic way. So like one person, one vote, there is like a, you know, web state. Um, and for this thing, you need an identity, obviously. You need somehow to know, uh, you know, proof of humanity. You need to know that people are not minors. Uh, you need all kind of stuff. And you need it in a way which is not controlled by one country, or by one, sorry, company for the same reason that, you know, a state has an identity which is not controlled by one company. Um, so I said, from my narrow point of view, I just think the Web2 identity doesn't fit the settings. Maybe I'll, I'll share one thing. I think the, the first Web2 identity gets a lot of things right, right? Which is essentially, it is the first incarnation of single sign-on for the web, which is you create your account once and you can go to any other website and kind of sign in. So, uh, and, and, you know, Google and Apple and Facebook, et cetera, do a phenomenal job of that experience. I think the thing that's missing is the, the concept of shared rails, which means can we ensure that today you can use Google and tomorrow you can use Facebook or whatever other competitors out there uh, without needing to kind of 
um, resubmit all the information that you have. It's really the concept, like a different way of thinking about it is, is true single one-click checkout for the web, true single one-click single sign-on for the web. So it's a generalized version um, like Web3 is essentially a generalized version of what started a, in Web2 as kind of siloed version of single sign-ons. It's a generalized version on kind of these shared rails that let you extend not just how you interact, but what you save uh, on those shared rails. So that's, that's, it's more of a kind of a, an evolution versus like a replacement. Uh, just like general thing about identity, so there is a guy, uh, British, I think his name is David Birch or Bridge, I'm not completely sure. Uh, he wrote a book uh, in 2014, I think, Identity is the New Money. Uh, and I uh, just recommend for people who are interested in identity as a concept, um, philosophical concept connected to, to, to Web3 and to blockchain to read it. I, uh, I, I read it and it, lots of ideas that I have as, as, are from this book. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm definitely guilty of like Web2 single sign-on, like uh, even though, you know, we might criticize it. I think it works well uh, since I've transitioned to Apple as a previous Apple hater. I only use login with Apple and it just works well, you know. But I think like one big difference is that with the like kind of Web2 flow, you are relying on like the issuer of that identity, right? So if you're logging in with Apple, it's like Apple that actually owns the identity. And you're kind of telling Apple everywhere you log into, all the data you're sharing with them. And I think like a decentralized identity kind of allows you to remove that um, issuer of the ID, right? You're the, you're the issuer and you can automatically uh, self like identify yourself to the apps you use. And uh, you know, I'm sure we'll go into it in the, later on with like uh, zero knowledge proofs. You can also decide what you want to show, right? Which currently, you know, it's like something you don't have in the kind of like web two flow. Um, so this decentralized infrastructure, it sounds like enables something which is uh, uh, some might call it self-sovereign identity, where you yourself are responsible for uh, not, a, not only holding the identifiers uh, that you choose to uh, identify with, uh, but then you can take that and, and choose how you interact with the rest of the world. Um, so Makoto, maybe I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, ENS is, I think at the forefront and perhaps the most widely used uh, decentralized identifier. Um, and so uh, what was that like kind of being there uh, early on and, and helping build that? Um, and where, where does ENS see identif identity going in the future? Yeah, so ENS didn't really exist to create in the mission of, oh, we're gonna make a, a Web3 identity. It kind of just evolved through the fact that when Ethereum and the blockchain happened, first thing is like you have to remember the long like hexadecimal addresses which no one can do. So we actually initially, our first mission is just how to make it user friendly. So we already had a purpose. So even though ENS is actually one of the longest running smart contract on Ethereum, which went live on 2017, uh, May 4th, we remember the May the 4th be with you. Yeah, and uh, it's been running for over five, six years. But like even from the beginning, we had a massive uh, uptick because there's already a user who's using uh, blockchain. And we are kind of evolved with the progress of Ethereum that like uh, initially it was just for the payment solution. But then people start using like, uh, you know, there's a DeFi came and uh, uh, when DeFi, Uniswap and the Aave and it comes in, they had their own kind of ways to log in. Then now we have a system called primary name where you can associate your same address to name, which we call reverse. So that like if you log into each DAP, even though they do on its own, uh, you can all see ENS name as a kind of Web3 unique identity. So that was the second evolution. And now like all the NFT artists or uh, anyone who's, what's my way of uh, Web3 identity is uh, it's like you are what you did on chain. So like you could just squat on like Vitalik.is, but if you didn't do anything related to what he's, he's doing, that's not Vitalik, right? And also I have, if you look at, I have an ENS name called matoken.eth. Uh, you can see all the governance voting I did on Snapshot and all the kind of NFT I own. Or uh, I actually, own, one thing I can be proud of is my collection of Pope. <laughs> like uh, I've been in the event since 2016, so I have a collection. So all these things build up and we are uh, there to kind of support. So like, yeah, that, that's kind of way how ENS been evolving. Yeah, and uh, I think now 
these guys are building on top of us, I guess. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, big fan of VNS. Like Mimi is building like kind of like a social layer on top of VNS, and uh, we're kind of like excited about the idea of like ENS as a global username. Um, but yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Makoto said, and like very bullish on ENS in general. Um, but yeah, not much to add in ENS specifically. <laughs> I just want. To, I think it's one thing is that it's a uh, all things about Web three about collaboration that we've been building on top of Ethereum, and that these guys are also building on top of ENS, and it's, we are not on its own, it doesn't have much power, but by working together, I think we get like kind of power which Web2 doesn't have on their own, I think. Maybe I'll add this. Okay. Just, just to add one thing, I, I think one of the coolest things about the Ethereum ecosystem in general, and ES, ENS specifically, is the fact that it was created as a public good. Right, is the fact that there, there's, the, I think the concept of public goods in the center, kind of shared rails in the center, uh, that allow kind of companies around it to thrive, but kind of agreement on kind of central, you know, the 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 um, a public good identity like ENS or or the, the entire concept of kind of shared rails on Ethereum is what makes this really special. I think ENS kind of paved the way on that and and. You know, both created a lot of obviously business opportunities, but also uh, just you know established what should be the standard for these shared rails and where the line is for public good projects uh, that everyone should kind of share the benefit in, literally with the token drop, I guess. But uh, like, uh, uh, but also figuratively, uh, you know, the ability to just kind of uh, share that experience, share that system uh, while creating an ecosystem of companies around it. So that's that's just a massive achievement. Uh, so I completely agree with what you said about the public good. I think that this is like a unique feature of Web3. I think that what ENS did is, is phenomenal. Uh, like, uh, I mean, I, I do projects without like investors since 2017 um, to varying degrees of success. Some succeeded enough to support me nicely and some failed. Um, but w w from what happened with ENS made it, make it much easier for me now to tell people I do it without investors. Because there is an example of this going super well. Uh, and I think that like, the challenge of Web3 would be not only to begin as public good, this basic infrastructure, but also to remain public good like over time. Uh, especially the more income those protocols have, the more money there, there, are, there is. And I think like, this is kind of a stage where we are of you know, testing which governance uh, models fit for a protocol. Not only to, be, like, not only to begin public good, but remain over time and, and it's, it's a huge uh, challenge yeah so th the promise of a public good is is good in itself but uh i think it, it poses a specific challenge that we might all experience which is that just because the rails are public and the data is public the user experience sometimes uh suffers because of that and uh I can say, you know, it, us at Sapana, we're, we're building a search infrastructure for Web3, and although the data is open source and public, it, it is a huge challenge to get that data organized and accessible to people. So um, I'm curious how you guys think of uh, kind of improving the user experience when it comes to identity, because, you know, one of the, you spoke about the single sign-in, um, Web2 has this very, very big network effect, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to its benefits. Um, and so how do we begin to solve this cold start problem of, of having a, a single sign in or having a, um, a kind of easy to use uh, identity uh, within Web3? Sure, I, I can start, I guess. But uh, um, I think to your point, one, one of the so first, I think if you kind of fast forward a couple of years, I think there is an argument to be made that everything in your uh, phone becomes a wallet, right? And a way, and a good example of that is how Coinbase turned their 70 million kind of users in, via Coinbase MPC into essentially kind of wallets on your phone. And so a, a, a fundamental way to actually accelerate and kind of get through the cold start problem is not necessarily to convince everyone you know, to set up a MetaMask and, and buy, a, 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 you know, an ENS domain and so on, but rather start turning on existing apps 
and make them into Web3 apps. So again, a second example is Robinhood uh, with their non-custodial wallet offering or coming back to Coinbase, right? Coinbase generated, um, you know, an ENS name, right, for uh, a vast majority of folks in an extremely easy way. Uh, and that's where kind of incentives come in of what is the, if everyone can now compete with a login with Google or login with Facebook um, with a nicer interaction that's also a payment interaction, it's also a kind of data storage interaction, there are a lot of incentives for a bunch of companies, whether it's, again, Robinhood or Coinbase or a firm or PayPal or, you know, um, any, or, or Cash App, uh, all to become wallets, and they are becoming wallets, right? And so that is fundamentally the way we actually d jump through the cold start problem is not by trying to convince a, million, a billion users to set up MetaMask, but rather uh, show existing consumer apps that becoming wallets is a f fundamentally better business proposition for them, for their customers, uh, and, and it, it will just accelerate. My, my hypothesis, and sorry to run long, but my hypothesis is y the wallet you will use in five years is likely already an app on your phone that will just have a tab uh, that is turned on with some sort of MPC type solution or account abstraction solution, you know, just to be trendy, uh, but uh, that, that just fundamentally brings you into the ecosystem. That's right. Yeah. I think Itai is a very good speaker because every time that he speaks, I have something to say afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I feel time to say today, I really represent my limited point of view on, on things. I like, I think that Ethereum was not built, uh, like I saw the beginning of Ethereum kind of, uh, and I think it was not built by, by people who ditched Bitcoin to Ethereum. It was like a lot of new people who found crypto and they just started on Ethereum because this was like the new, better, more exciting and uh, new grounds. So the way that I see, uh, imagine that, and, and I have no idea, is not, is not at first like the big companies uh, jumping into this web free identity, but it's more like the new projects build there because there are opportunities there, uh, because, uh, you know, there is nobody to compete with yet, so you have a chance to be. And only once you have like a one, two huge success stories, and at some point there will come like a huge success story, then vo those companies uh, will have to jump, even if only to be trendy, n not mentioning the, the, the advantages. But again, just my vision, uh, you know, imagining the future. Actually, I think we just had an example. Like, how many people knows POAP, Proof of Attendance Protocol? Right. So, like, this one is a, a POAP card we issued during DevCon to 2,000 people, where, like, it turns everybody to be the your own POAP machine. So, like, if you, this is an NFC card, and if you tap it, and it means it's a POAP NFT. See uh, NFT to your wallet, and uh, before this session, I was just trying to give this to these guys, and they were saying, "Oh, I didn't bring wallet, so I can't have this pop." But hey, you can just send it via ENS name, you know. So like, and they also this pop is great that they use it on the Gnosis chain, where they gas is so cheap, so they actually substitute for the gas. So something like uh, the uh, you know gas. Um, meta transaction or they're using ENS, you can actually make it a lot, lot easier. So most of the stuff is like, you don't have the fund and you have to manage a seed. That's the kind of two biggest hurdle right now, but there's lots of ways to kind of mitigate it. So like, you know, solutions already out there. We've spoken uh, a little bit about decentralizing the infrastructure that other things uh, sit on top of. Um, but I'm curious to hear how you guys think about the actual attestations or the actual proofs of, of your identity. Uh, so you went to a certain college or you are a certain age, um, you know, beyond having these things sit on Ethereum or sit on ENS, how do we move towards a world where we don't have to uh, trust, uh, you know, one entity to say that you are who you are, but rather, you know, you can uh, own that responsibility and that opportunity. I can go. Actually, I, I didn't know what this would be a question, but it's great for me because it's an opportunity to, you know, tell why, I, why, why I'm here under a project called Bull Ball. Uh, what's written here is a project called Asteroids. Uh, it's a project that I've been doing with Tomer, who is over there. Uh, since a year and a half, it's a .eth search engine, so the central search engine for .eth websites uh, built on top of ENS and IPFS. 
Um, but yesterday we kind of launched a new project which is called Woolball and it's an ID project which heavily relies on the stations. Um, and the, the reason was that among our experiments of doing things with, with, with ENS and .eth websites, we kind of built a super silly blogging platform, the center, it's called a Citadef with a C in the beginning. It, 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 I designed it with generative, uh, possibly generated art, so it looks like something that a child made, very colorful, but uh, it's working. And uh, it's without a server. And when people open a blog, basically they have to come and, you know, um, get an NFT which represents the blog. The NFT creates a kind of a link between the ENS name of the platform and the ENS name of the people and the account is on this NFT and we, we had to work to, you know, implement all the account rules that we, ha that we want to, that we, that we want, uh, that are needed for this blog system. Um, and then uh, we thought that if we want to do, people want to do more such platforms, decentralized platforms, they need something a bit easier way to do that. So um, we created like Woolball, which is a way to create links between IDs. Links are kind of attestations. So in a social uh, media, uh, social media platform, a link would be a friendship, would be a comment. I think that this is how Lens. Lens is working, they have like tokens over tokens and you know, every comment thread is like a, a ERC721 token and stuff like this. Uh, it can also be accounts which represent like, you know, an ongoing connection. Uh, SBT for me is like kind of at the station which is a bit sophisticated but it's not because it's not that you give someone something and it's there forever. Uh, I mean, you need to say what happens if the person, you know, transfer the ENS names, what happens if they lost it, it's like community controlled. Um, so I like, you know, we think that the stations are so important that we literally just based a new project on top of it. Uh, we want at the beginning at least to do it together with Optimism that have their own uh, uh, at the station um, infrastructure. I forgot at the moment the name, the top of my head, I apologize. Um, there are the stations is between accounts, so this account made us the station for another account. Uh, we do it between names, which for us is like a attestation between IDs. Um, I think that like this has to be the future of you know the web free uh, identity because your identity is not only what you say about yourself; it's a lot of what people say about you. Um, if you want to have a spam filter, which is web free, you need to have some kind of attestation, reputation, and to know that somebody with zero is a bit suspicious. If you want, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm in DAO since 2018, and, and uh, people want to come and join. I don't know if this is like, I don't know if it's a bot, if it's a scammer, or it's someone which I really should, you know, hug and take to my DAOs, and all of those attestations are important. Uh, definitely, it should come along with uh, privacy which we are not there yet. Uh, we spoke about when we designed the project and one of the <laughs> project designer told us, if you're gonna have privacy there, then this is basically, this should be the project, <laughs> the privacy, uh, because this is the state that privacy is. So right now, the station is super important. Privacy is essential in the long term for this. Um, and yeah, thank you. I guess just maybe I'll say, you know, attestations essentially create better user, can create better user experience, right? And and maybe I, I won't like the, maybe we can just talk briefly about two examples of how they create better user experience that fundamentally decentralized attestations uh, become really critical. So the first one, if you apply to, a, if you ever applied to a job in the US, uh, the first thing they ask you is for proof that you went to college, right? And essentially the, the first thing they do then is say, well, we don't really trust you with your proof that you went to college, uh, please go to your university uh, and have them mail us directly with that proof, right? And so wh whomever ever applied for a job in the US uh, fundamentally understands that that's a, that's a, I'm not gonna use strong words, but that's an unpleasant 
experience. Uh, and so decentralized attestations essentially solve that by issuing you a signed credential, a signed university degree, degree that lets you show and um, kind of prove that you are who you say are, or you are the holder of that credential, right? So that's use case number one that fundamentally makes life easier for people. User use case number two is the same with age verification uh, or identity or like uh, uh, ID verification, which is uh, I would argue that 100% of the people in this room have probably b went to a bank or went to a fintech company and were asked to upload an ID of the front and back to take a selfie. And then as soon as they finished that, they went to a second website and literally had to do the same thing over again. Right, and so the fact that um, you know there are a bunch of really interesting companies around attestations of identity or of, of kind of um, essentially a tokenization of identity, which let you kind of attest on website A and carry that result with you on website B. So those are kind of two fundamental experiences that just make for a better user experience. Um, you know, whether they're soulbound tokens or whether they're kind of DIDs and verifiable credentials, uh, one could argue, but they, they they just create this better user experience and and you know as a descent centralized identity. So n now that we're all walking around with wallets in our pocket that holds all of the you know dearest and truest things about us, how does privacy uh, 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 come into this uh, conversation? Uh, it, you know, a lot of people speak about ZK proofs and what those can bring to identity. Um, is, is there value to decentralized identity even before we have that? Um, or is this a waiting game until we can have the, the kind of final solution, uh, if you will, uh, of, uh, of you know, privacy preserving attestations and, and uh, Web3 identity? Um, I mean, I think privacy is like a core element which really drives value to like decentralized identity. I guess more in the short term, you do have like some values like, you know, you can still do the sign in, sign on stuff, registration stuff without like overly relying on privacy. You can probably filter bots out like uh, Neyman was saying, you know, like you can see based on the decentralized identity or like, you know, try to like see if there are patterns of bots. But I think the real value really comes from privacy in the long term, you know, when you don't have to expose like your full identity, you can just like prove that you're overage to go drink a beer. You don't have to like uh, give all your identity away where you live. But I think there is value in the short term, but I'm, you know, I'm definitely much more bullish on like the uh, long term full privacy solution with like zero knowledge proofs and what that kind of like enables in like the web free space and just identity in general. So I'm going to jump here out of my comfort zone and speak about social media. Uh, I think that maybe one thing, so if you do a project now with privacy in Web3, then privacy is, implementing privacy is the focus of your project. It's your sales point. This is the state that we are. But I think maybe one exception is social media, which anyway is supposed to be social and not private, and most of your activity, you know, <laughs> you, you, you want people to see it, and the only thing that you want to be private in social media is, um, you know, your private messages with people. But I think that, like, private messages is something that you don't need ZK for. It's stuff that you can implement, and was implemented, even decentralized settings, or, you know, even in, like, I'm fine with using... Uh, uh, stuff which encryption nowadays of centralized company because it's locally encrypted that's completely fine so I think that like one thing that you can build nowadays is social media and indeed we see lens and uh, Farscape and stuff building and I don't know how you improve them with ZK you don't need to maybe just from the kind of company's perspective I think there's there's gonna be a shift I think more and more companies realize after being sued by pretty much everyone, more and more companies realize that data is not necessarily an asset. Sometimes it's a liability, right? Uh, and inherently, um, what like the, the concept of you having to store uh, someone's social security number or someone's like medical documents or someone's ID on your server is is this terrifying concept uh, that I, I don't know how companies survive with. And so I think it's it's going to be a necessity not just from the end user wanting to preserve their privacy, but rather from companies wanting to push away information that they don't have to store outside the scope of what they store and are responsible for uh, and, com and, and significantly de-risk their liability uh, for hacks and lawsuits and things of that sort. Uh, so I, I think we're gonna see a second wave come from the concept of data as liability, not as asset, not just from like the 
privacy preserving, you know, how it's better for end consumers. The one thing to, can you hear me? Yep. One thing to add is some of the common sense of what we do day to day still apply, even though all these ZK things uh, comes in place that like, I think it, when we say privacy, especially in the blockchain sense, it's not just privacy that like I want to hide the fact that my full history, but also because that our identity on the blockchain is actually wallet address. And because wallet address tend to carry the trait of your financial record, uh, that could have a kind of security risk over you get basically stolen mugs. So some of the common sense of like, you know, you don't bring like a million dollars in your wallet still in the cash. Uh, you don't, you never do that here as well. So also that applies like, you know, don't put your million dollar fund into your MetaMask and then just put it into your wallet. That, that kind of stuff, I think no matter whether ZK comes in like 100%, you still have to have some common sense, like, you know, and also another thing, I think I had uh, some conversation with the uh, organizer here, like, you know, I asked, oh, hey, do you have a ENS name? And the first response was, well, I don't want to put, associate my identity to your wallet address. Mm -hmm. But again, like, you don't have to put your full name as your ENS name, right? It's just like a nickname. And uh, you only associate, and it, I put like, a, I'm a kind of, you know, maxi. So I put like a, my ENS name as a, my Twitter profile everywhere. Everybody should know my ENS name, but like that doesn't mean like I have like a million, million dollars found in my, you know, thing. This only thing it has a pop. Yeah, like if I get hacked on my wallet, I lose my pop, sad, but like, a, <laughs> it's just like, a, yeah. But like, a, again, like, a, that's just for sad, but I don't lose a million dollars just by holding things. So I think these things like, a, you have a different personality and uh, in the on-chain it's ma a lot harder to separate but still like there's a ways to i think wallet can be the different your identity if you want to mix your own chain trail you just consolidate it on one address if it's not you separate like just same thing as i don't mix my twitter which is crypto only and my instagram which is a completely different purpose i don't mix it you can do that with the, you know ens and the same address as well it's just like certain things like you just have to have a certain operation build up, mostly comes from your day-to-day, -day, you know, common sense activity. So I, I think you still need that. I just want you to stress that. Yeah, for all the hackers in the room, uh, Makoto is not the right uh, person to hack. He's thought of everything. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so we have a few minutes left and I thought we could uh, finish on, um, uh, you know, where, uh, identity is heading and what what is left to build here so you know we obviously spoke about zk and and the things that may or may not come from that but in in the near term um where would you like to see builders focusing on uh when it comes to web3 identity oh it's a hard question i mean privacy is is the thing that you asked not to talk about is what i want people to to focus on but otherwise uh, integration uh, I mean, uh, integration of so of, of different kinds of, of identities, signing with Ethereum, uh, making, like I mean, said from my point of view, making connections between the identities, this attestation, which I think is super important uh, for reputation uh, and for you know uh, working in Web3. But basically, privacy and integration and attestations is where I want people to focus. There is definitely still a lot to do because we are so early. There is, uh, I mean, there is really not like, so there are good standards, like like sign with Ethereum, but there is still not one standard or something which is super convenient uh, to the point that I have to say, I, I, I obviously use web free websites and platforms where I have to use my decentralized identity. And because it is not that convenient, I actually use them less. <laughs> like I have to do some effort to, to log in to open my Ethereum account, which is in my case always uh, locked and this kind of stuff. So, so there is so much to do. Yeah, maybe that's a fourth thing. UX needs a lot of work. I'm not the address for that, but if there are UX people here, please <laughs> uh, come and talk to us. Lots of work. Yeah, I, I would say the the main folk. So I'm excited about a bunch of a bunch of things, right? I think there are really interesting things around um, left to build around kind of 
social decentralized social networks and again those shared rails at the core and uh, UIs around them like a farcast or a lens or anything of that sort uh, I get excited about anything that pushes the envelope forward on distribution I think again there, there are network effects you start you mentioned this at the start which are like we win and everyone in this room wins if there are these massive network effects uh, that uh, make everyone move to decentralized identity or literally move to just a better product, right? And so any app, any kind of developer tool that works on, um, you know, bringing, uh, you know, MPC into into apps to make them wallets, right? And and pushes or uh, lowers the bar to generate uh, ENS names at scales on you know or or on L twos or, or things of that sort. Uh, that is is in my opinion, kind of this critical component because we can build whatever we want to build, but really like, uh, and every startup founder realized this very early on, which is it's not about product, it's about distribution, right? And so uh, in a similar way for for this entire thing to win, it's about startups kind of helping accelerate distribution uh, and uh, ubiquity of of this stuff um, across across everything with that vision that everything everything in your phone becomes a wallet in five years uh, and you shouldn't necessarily know about it but it, it'll be a wallet yeah one thing i'd add is i think you know like i think everything we talk about like poops ens if you look at people who are like active in that scene it's a very like a very very small tranche of the whole world right and i think if you look at like digital identity in the future if you like really think you know it can be like fundamental change to how people identify even for like governance and stuff um i think like getting the mass adoption is very important you know and so i think like focusing on ui ux account abstraction will probably play a big role in that and just like getting regular users onboarded into uh, digital identities without them necessarily even knowing it right which will probably mostly be solved by account abstraction uh, if we get there i think that will be like really vital and probably like a good opportunity for startups to kind of work on that like it just put <coughs> the figure of like how early we are is like i think it, i read the article somewhere like we ethereum address about about like 200 to 300 million like a unique address ever exists then ens uh there's actually three million names minted but like uh, some people like to you know have many names so actually if you think of the unique address who owns the ens is still like half a million so that means like uh, less than one percent of the people who actually tell you like you know hey send me ETH or send me nft you can even name it you know so that's like crazy early if you compare the internet like where like you know hey where's your website no one tells you ip address right like that's like that's the difference we are still early so it's like missing everything i think so you can yeah there's so many things to build but like i think starting point is like yeah wallet parts i look into the uh i went to the stockware sessions and uh, i think there's a company called cartridge and the they are focusing the uh, Starknet, uh, uh, Starknet community, and uh, they have a kind of account abstraction uh, uh, built in as a protocol, and uh, they're trying to do it in a way that uh, you don't have, and the user doesn't have to manage seed, and uh, they have a uh, lots of ways to, as a key signing. I think one of the limitation with Ethereum, like Ethereum, only has one way of doing the key signing, and uh, that was hard to manage because you have to manage the seed. But someone like Starknet, kind of pioneering the ways to let in different way of signing and manage keys. So I think these are the uh, key part to build on top of it. So I think one thing that I would really like to see people build in the center's identity, and I think it will also solve like a, a real world problem for many people is a KYC. I as a person who lives since many years between countries suffer from KYC on a almost daily basis. Uh, my life is not conventional and it's a pain in every time that I have to identify and then again and again and again. And also I know it makes me feel uncomfortable because my passport is everywhere already. That's quite obvious. On the other side, I speak with people uh, from who build projects in blockchain and they are afraid of the tornado cash thing. They don't want to violate the privacy of the projects, but they don't want to be sued because who wants to be sued? Nobody wants to break the law. And uh, like if, 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 if there are people who focus on KYC in a dissenter's identity uh, uh, side, it basically solves both the real life problem of KYC 
and the problem for the developers who make private projects. I think this is connected to reputation and attestation. You know, it's all connected to one another, but I want to be, see people working on that. Thank you, everybody, for coming to this panel, and uh, thank you to uh, our wonderful audience and uh, building blocks, and uh, hopefully we're just a little bit closer to uh, decentralized identities and uh, privacy-preserving internet tools. So thank you all.